Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of I Like to Read with me, your host, Rachel Polanski. I threw on makeup just for you guys, just for the visual listeners, um, or watchers, I suppose, <clears throat> although you're doing both. Um, what's up? What's up? Uh, not much on my end as we approach the one-year anniversary or we already passed the one-year anniversary of the pandemic. I think it was, like, yesterday, and at the time of release, this is coming out the week after. Um, and so for a lot of people, it's kind of like, you know, what's it like when I re-enter the world and, like, have to go back to work and re- wear real clothes? And I love my new job because I don't have to do any of that. I can still just, you know, like, make myself look, like, sort of presentable on the top half and talk to people, and then I don't have to, via the internet, and I don't have to go anywhere, and that's amazing, and everyone is super nice. Um, this is not a Rachel's job in life. Well, I guess, you know, life update a little bit. Um, so there's that. Um, we recently concluded watching the show, the HBO miniseries Band of Brothers. Um, it came out in 2001, actually, first came out like two days before September 11th, which is pretty crazy, just, you know, coincidentally. But um, it is the story of the 101st Airborne Company, um, EZ Company, who did the D-Day to V-Day trip. And it just tells their story. And it's really, really well done. It's, you know, as someone who came in with a lot of prejudice and bias is like, I'm not interested in World War II and this stuff is boring. Like, they make it interesting and accessible and... You know, I knew the general details of the war, but it really, like, shows a lens into something. Um, just, you know, these ordinary men who, you know, you think about as sort of stand-ins for so many other men as well. Just really fantastic cinematography and production design and pacing. And just to have it be, like, a 10-part miniseries, of course, because, you know, it's not the sort of thing that really, like, requires expansion beyond its initial story. They just keep the pacing tight, but still, like, comprehensive. Um, <clears throat> so even if you, like, watched it a while ago, especially with, like, the glut of other TV out there and stuff, like, I definitely recommend checking it out and seeing, like, of course it holds up, but it's also really crazy just to think that that came out all the way back in 2001. Um, so do, 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 do. today's five books, um, we are going to get started. <laughs> today's first book, I actually have the physical copy. This is Milk Fed by Melissa Broder. Let me just pause a sec for a thumbnail, Jason, maybe while you're editing this, this will work. Look at a few different options. Sorry for the dead air. Um, so this came out... February, I think. Um, yeah, February 10th, two days before my birthday. Um, so I had pre-ordered it actually all the way back in September or August because Melissa Broder, um, if you're a longtime listener of my podcast, will know that I'm a huge fan of Melissa. I listen to her podcast is sad today. So I actually won a giveaway by pre-ordering <clears throat> a copy of this book. Um, and I got a signed copy of her other one of her other books, So Sad Today, um, and a couple other fun things, like a signed mini box of cereal. Uh, so I listened to her podcast. I read the Pisces. I read her other works. I've been following her on Twitter for quite a long time. Um, so I read this actually just a few weeks ago, um, cheating a little bit by just sticking it in here because I didn't have a place really to fit in with the other books. And I felt like it kind of just fit in this week. And I wanted to take the time to think about it and talk about it. Um, but did, did, did. So Milk Fed, um, the main character's name is Rachel. Um, she is a 24-year-old Jewish woman struggling with dis- an eating disorder. Wow, so relatable. Um, as if that doesn't sound like me. I mean, I definitely would put my eating disorder as, like, categorize it as in the, like, slightly disordered eating. I mean, definitely very disordered in high school to, like, minorly disordered in college and then really just, like, not giving a fuck but also, like, tampering down a bit from that and figuring out, you know, like, what is healthy but also, like, what do I want? Whole thing. So she definitely – she is, like – I relate to her in terms of like the counting calories and behaviors of how I was in high school down to the Vita tops. Like I, Melissa is wonderfully descriptive and really makes Rachel's longings come alive. I mean, Melissa is very candid herself about her past eating disorders and fixations and addictions. So it's no surprise that she's able to very beautifully detail that in another character, um, especially with the Los Angeles backdrop. Some of the restaurants that she visits are fictional, some are real. Um, so I, you know, really recognize the setting and been to quite a few of the food places. Um, 
just, just lost my train of thought. Um, so like I said, uh, Rachel is our main character. She is what she, you know, she's trying to keep her life alive and her eating disorder is like both harming her, but also like the only thing that's really like keeping her in order and keeping her with this routine. Um, and so she has this routine. Part of that is to go to this frozen yogurt place where she very carefully gets um, a half cup, very, uh, no toppings, very plain. It's like her salvation for the day. So she's just living life kind of miserable, not like having any goals or aspirations. And then she meets um, Miriam, who is a young Zoftig woman, a large, curvy, Orthodox Jewish woman at the yogurt place who really um, unlocks in Rachel um, this longing and desire through eating um, and through accepting of her own body and her own self, but also what it's like to love another woman. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, Jewish mythology and Jewish um, lore steeped into this present day story, which is really cool. Um, there's, you know, a little bit of speculation as to whether or not Miriam is, you know, a golem that Rachel has manifested, um, even though she's like a real person, you know, it's like, is she there? <laughs> for Rachel or, you know, like, is part of Rachel's story. Like, we, I know that um, Melissa is developing a milk fed into a TV show. And we're going to get more of Miriam's perspective in that. I read in another interview, which is great because Rachel's a fascinating character as well. But I'd love to get the perspective of the other people um, who surround the periphery of her world. So it's just a really wonderful cool book um very visceral very detailed about a woman falling in love with another woman but also like falling in love with herself and falling in love with food and her body and rediscovering a love that is very hard you know it's easier said than done um and there might not be like a perfect neat bow to that but life goes on and i'm excited to see where rachel's journey will go on the screen i'm excited to keep uh, I know that, you know, I'll keep listening to the, so the Eating Alone in My Car podcast, um, but she was talking about this book for quite a while. Of course, you know, it was her upcoming project. I remember her even, I think, like talking about the beginning of writing this and the outline uh, back when it was just an idea and then to have actually read it um, and see it come to fruition and hold it in my hands is pretty cool. Um, so that's Milk Fed by Melissa Broder. Next, we have The Upstairs House by Julia Fine. Um, so this was cool. It was kind of um, like a little bit of a Twilight Zone thrillery aspect, but with a, also a lot more like groundedness to it as if like, you know, the thriller was the way for our main character, um, Megan, to open up. But like it wasn't so much the crux of the story. So Megan it has just given birth to her new son. She is living um, pretty much. I mean, she has a husband, but her husband's away. So they're kind of like alone in this new house. And one day she... Um, goes upstairs and like she finds this weird door and she finds this woman margaret brown who is actually a real historical margaret wise brown who is the author of the uh good night moon amongst other things and megan is actually um working on a dissertation and a p uh, a book about margaret wise brown um so it's a little bit you know metafictional um there's the larger question as to whether or not Margaret Wise Brown is real or a figment of Megan's imagination. Um, there's a lot of, you know, postpartum and new mother thematic stuff happening, but in a very, like, realistic way. I know I've talked about other stories and books, um, particularly The Push, which was a very, like, horror-focused, like, is my child the spawn of Satan type thing. And this is much more about, like, Megan, like her child is a wonderful, you know, for all intents and purposes, pure entity. And it's really about, you know, not even a darkness inside herself too. this more just sort of like longing as we've talked about in a ton of other novels and what it's like to, um, you know, I guess there's, it becomes a little more like supernatural and ghosty towards the end. But again, it's like not heavy handed in its metaphorical sense, but it's very, um, you know, it doesn't feel just sort of like a deus ex machina ghost. Um, so it's very, you know, for P it's touted on, <clears throat> excuse me, touted on Goodweed, Good, Goodweeds, Goodreads as Shirley Jackson meets the awakening. And I, I mean, I think so. I mean, there's definitely like the Shirley Jackson ghost stuff, like I said, but it's less of a horror piece and more of that meditation on women and the awakening and that sort of, you know, young transition from self to self with other. 
Um, so that is the upstairs house. Next, we have The Blade Between by Sam J. Miller. Um, so this was a cool one. So this um, takes place in the city of Hudson, New York, which at first I kind of was reading. It was like, oh, yeah, I've been there like I, I just a few times. But like, I know that place. And then it very quickly become real. You realize that sort of this Hudson um, that Sam J. Miller creates is both the Hudson that is real and that you think you know if you've been to or lived in or whatnot, but also very much not. It's sort of a Hudson steeped in the historical past that Sam J. Miller has researched as well as fictionalized through the ghost characters that we come to know in this novel um uh hudson is sort of at the epicenter because it's being gentrified and our characters that we meet um particularly ronin and um dom who grew up in hudson they have come back ronin has come back ronin is a recovering drug addict dom is a police officer he stayed there having grown up there and so how they reckon with the Hudson that they grew up in love with the Hudson that is sort of being forced and thrust upon them through gentrification. Um, so that seems like the first, you know, threat, like, oh my gosh, these gentrifiers and these realtors are coming in, they're raising the prices, but then it's also cool because Sam Miller adds a supernatural element, which I won't, you know, get too much into to spoil, but I'll just say that it's like a supernatural element that pulls from history and has like a clear purpose and is not, again, like I just said, you know, sort of that deus ex machina ghost, but is also very much like a metaphor, but adds something to this you know, to give it more than just a surface, like, oh, another novel about gentrification and whatever. Um, and also, you know, of course, there's the metaphor of, like, the demons that, <clears throat> that maybe I'm losing my voice, I hope not, the demons that live inside us and the external and the internal demons and all that. But it's just, a, it's a pretty, um, it's a meditation on um, change and how we personally react to it, how our personal lives and histories are shaped um, by our experiences and what we make of them and how we react to past experiences and bring them into the present and the future. Um, so if any of that sounds like your jam, check out this one. And next we have Later by Stephen King. <laughs> you know, a little author named Stephen King. Um, so I'd say I'd read a good catalog of his work. Um, I don't always read like the most recent things. Like I definitely have a few of his more recent ones like on my Kindle ready to be read. I just haven't gotten to them yet. Um, but this one came in through Library Roulette. This one is um, more of a novella. I mean, it's not a novella, but it's 240 pages. So it's not anywhere near the sort of like 500 plus tomes that were typical of being given by King. Um, I think this technically falls in his like hard boiled, like detective crime, sort of like mass market intended paperback, you know, very like vintage 1950s looking covers. Um, but definitely with that same like Stephen King energy, uh, of course, it's an author. Um, it has a lot of um, the sort of coming of age young boy, our main character, Jamie, um, he has the ability to see dead people, sort of like the sixth sense, which is literally played off at the beginning of the novel. Um, we are looking at the world through Jamie's eyes. We see him grow up and deal with this ability and how it affects him and his mom. And then he gets mixed up with an NYPD officer who wants to exploit his abilities, of course. So we have that, you know, like crime, hard-boiled detective novel line running through it, just the sort of like NYPD detective gone rogue and drugs and like wanting to exploit this young boy. But then when you add the supernatural element to it and the way that, you know, a young boy coming of age is fascinating in itself, anyone's sort of coming of age story, whether, you know, if you spin it the right way is fascinating. But especially when you add the supernatural element and this like personal ability that separates him from other people, um, it's really cool. And it, it flows really quickly. Um he's a master of writing of course he knows what he's doing i don't need i don't need to tell you too much more other than that like if you're into horror and crime if you feel like you're a stephen king fan of course check this out if you feel like stephen king stuff hasn't typically been your jam before for whatever reason like maybe it was too supernatural or too weird or too out there or too long for you then maybe this is a cool place to start um i've read Joyland and at least one, yeah, Hard Case Crime or what these are called. So I've definitely read one or two others in the series. Um, They're a good avenue to go if you're not typically like into Stephen King, but if you're not like, what's wrong with you? Just kidding. I don't judge, but maybe a little. Um, And lastly, but certainly not, excuse me, <laughs> lastly, but certainly not least, we have Ring Shout by P. J. Lee Clark. I hope I am saying that right. Um, so once again, we have a sort of, I guess there's like a slightly thematic 
element to this episode where we're taking real life situations and places and historical events and either taking uh, a more realistic fictional liberty approach to it or a totally, you know, bonanza fantasy supernatural metaphorical lens at it, which is kind of the case we have with Ring Shout. Um, so Ring Shout is an alternate universe basically where the birth of the na- birth of a nation um, created by yeah, the birth of a nation by D.W. Griffith um, is actually like a mass brainwashing spell situation that turns white people or any pretty much anyone who watches it into a Ku Klux Klan member. And these Ku Klux Klan members are supernatural and otherworldly and evil and beyond human and like more than a zombie but like definitely like shedding that personal identity so that's of course an incredibly fascinating component and then we have Maryse who is our super cool protagonist she has friend we it's like we don't get to know like too much about her but it's almost like we know we already know everything about her if that makes sense like we don't need the basics of like her favorite color and what she was wearing because you just get to know her so much more through her actions which of course is like how a great writer writes um so she you know it would be a scary situation for anyone to be thrown into dealing you know with the Ku Klux Klan of course but especially when they're imagined or reimagined I should say as these um otherworldly supernatural beastly creatures and then when you're sort of just like living your life you know thinking one day you're just gonna wake up and drink some whiskey and otherwise um you are now fighting monsters and then you are called to a higher power and what happens with that and how do you sort of grapple with um saving the world literally from hell um you know not just in the metaphorical sense that a lot of black people were going through and very you know literally in hell with what was happening at the time but this takes it to a whole nother level and it's a really cool reimagining um and i'm excited to see what else i think this author has written um a few other historical sort of like not but like historical reimagining historical reimagining fantasy novels um this is under 200 pages it moves really quickly if you are enticed by that concept um check it out because you can definitely bang it out in like a night and less than 24 hours so that i think is it for this week's episode we're coming up on the one year anniversary pretty crazy you got to start thinking about some cool fun crazy thing to do um but until next time stay reading everybody bye